Yeah, so I'm Eric Rehnquist. I'm the butterfly conservation biologist at the Minnesota Zoo, and I manage the Prairie Butterfly Conservation Program. I'm going to give kind of a real overview real quickly of some of the work we've been doing. Um, we've been doing a lot. A lot of our work is, is based on um, the uh, establishment of breeding populations for potential reintroductions of Dakota skippers and Powashik skipperlings, but a really huge and I could give a whole you know, hour-long talk on just that. Um, but a really key important part of that is, well, and, and here's all of our funders got to acknowledge, especially the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Fund. Fish and Wildlife has been huge. Um, we need to be thinking about what's going on with these in the wild. It's not just enough for us to manage a zoo-based population. Uh, we need to be able to understand wild dynamics of Dakota skippers and Powashiks where they're supposed to be out in the wild. Um, you saw this graph early, earlier roughly. So we had these catastrophic declines of Powashik and Dakota skippers, um, and especially really in the, in the 2000s. And the correlation here, again, not necessarily the causation, but the correlation was that this is occurring uh, roughly around the same time, especially for Powashik when uh, the soybean aphid really took off. Um, so we're not necessarily pointing exact fingers at that. There's, as was brought up earlier, there are many likely interacting factors at once, um, and it may be a very local situation in some, in some situations. We have a lot of pretty good prairie that's remaining. So this is the Prairie Coteau Scientific Natural Area down in southwest Minnesota. Um, both species used to be here as, as late as like 2008 or 9, um, and doing just fine. Um, we don't really know why or why they've disappeared. Um, but like many of these other landscapes in the state, they've, um, they are largely surrounded on, on many sides by agricultural margins. Um, and so you turn around from that point where I just showed you before, um, we have a strong agricultural border here with soybean and corn pr primarily. Um, so we started a participatory uh, research program with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, thanks to that LCCMR money, um, and then Fish and Wildlife as well. And we wanted to really understand what are the what is the extent of drift that may be occurring from those agricultural margins into prairies. And so some of our questions: How do concentrations vary along the edge of a, a prairie, a, a native prairie, and uh, along that mar agricultural margin, and then in the interior pieces where theoretically there shouldn't be as much impact? Um, are there differences in, in where you're finding those insecticides? So, um, are, is there a latent sort of bank of pesticides that are existing in soils that may be brought up, especially neonicotinoids, um, and or and then being expressed in plants, or or are you just finding them really on the surface of plants? How do those vary across the years and across sites? And um, is are there correlations with the, ex the, the extinction events that we've observed for those butterflies? Um, so the Fish and Wildlife Service, then uh, we identified a, a series of sites where uh, those butterflies existed and then do not exist anymore. Um, and c then uh, created a GIS. This is that Prairie Coteau site again. This is a half a mile wide and about a mile, just over a mile long, um, and coded it by approximated agricultural. So a red margin here is within 10 meters of an agricultural border. White is an interior piece that's uh, at least 100 meters away from an ag agricultural event or a, a margin. So um, the idea is that we want to compare what's going on right along the edge and then what's on the interior. So uh, we've been collecting grass and soil samples at, at four sites, and now we just added a fifth one this year, um, and um, are having those and then analyzed at a, a USDA laboratory for a huge range of insecticides. And we're doing this in two different seasons. So uh, we're collecting um, at various points. So we created these randomly determined circles, and we would try to get within a, as close to that center as possible, pick a random uh, plant that is a host plant for these butterflies, so usually a little blue stem um, as, uh, as the caterpillar host, um, and then try to understand what's going on underneath that same plant with uh, some soil samples. Um, so then for just really quickly, we've got a lot of data that I could be showing you, but here's some sort of summary data. Um, on August 19th, 2014, I went out and surveyed and collected data at this Prairie Coteau site. Um, we knew spraying was occurring, but we didn't know, we didn't know exactly when it was occurring or where. Um, sent those back and uh, re received this, or some of this example data. So along uh, 
the agricultural margins here, we were seeing three different compounds and all on the interior as well, bifenthrin, chlorpyrifos, and cyhalothrin. Those are the three of the most commonly applied insecticides against soybean aphids. Um, we knew the airplanes were in the air at that time, um, applying compounds. Are we finding much of a interior versus edge uh, effects? Not really here. Um, so I was collecting this data, and we're seeing, you know, part, this is all parts per billion, so 12 parts per billion of bifenthrin, bifenthrin at this point, or 4.8 parts per billion of chlorpyrifos on the interior on that point there. Now remember some of these data points. So for example, down here, well within the center of the margin of the, the point, we're seeing so 21 parts per billion of chlorpyrifos, for example. That's soil data or grass? This, oh, so, uh, so the first number here is grass, and then in the parentheses is soil um, at that paired point. Um, generally, we're not finding anything in the soil. We're only, if, we only, if we do find anything in the soil, it's because the point on the plant right above it had a lot of insecticide on it in, in the first place. So the soil is not actually telling us much. This is really the concentrations that are observed drifting on, onto the grasses. So, um, so remember like 21 down here, for that, for clear proof, and then up here on this edge, so maybe nine at that point on that edge. So not a lot of difference. We don't know what that means biologically. I was collecting that data. Then at the end of the day, I observed planes in, in the air all day. And then after I'd finished all my sampling, that plane that I observed came and sprayed one of those agricultural fields um, as I was leaving at 6.30 at night, exhausted and tired. Um, so I decided to come back the next day and get repeat sampling as much as I could. Here's the day after. So we went from like nine, point, uh, nine parts per billion of chlorpyrifos at this point up to now 278 along that margin. The spraying was occurring, I think, in this block of um, kind of dark green up in that far upper left corner um, where that plane was spraying. And then so, then there was this other point that was like 20 parts per billion of chlorpyrifos on the interior. It was now over 100 the next day. This, from this point here down to here, that's 0.6 miles. So in direct line distance. So clearly uh, there was drift occurring. We saw significant rises between day one and day two. Um, what that means though, we don't know. But if we can infer anything from the honeybees, that's about 70 parts per billion is the LD50, the concentration to kill 50% uh, percent of honeybees. We don't know what that means for the butterflies. Eric, do you know which way the wind was blowing? It was a really remarkably still day. Yeah, um, I, I remember it being hot and sticky and still. So I don't think there was a lot of drift, or they, I don't think know how much that was actually contributing. It was probably under five miles an hour all day or which direction, like, because it was so small, I couldn't really determine it. Um, so some other example data. Um, that was the worst, that's, this was by far the worst amount of insecticides we've observed anywhere in all of our sampling. Um, most of our data so far looks like this. This is the most recent data we have from Hole in the Mountain Preserve. Um, and it was mentioned that we need to be thinking not only about retrospectively what might have contributed to the decline of these butterflies, but also then thinking forward. Um, the hole in the mountain preserve is, is being heavily considered as a reintroduction site for Dakota skippers with the population that we've now established at the Minnesota Zoo. A lot of our other data looks like this. So um, we're finding just a couple points here and there where we're seeing under 15 parts per billion and no strong edge effects. So this is an agricultural margin and fields up here and over in here. The in introduction areas are probably likely in the center of this preserve. I'm not seeing a huge amount of effects of, of drift um, or edges. Um, so, but it's not just about clear power force. That's the one we're most frequently seeing in these late summer samples. When we go in June, um, we're mostly actually just detecting atrazine, the, the widely used herbicide. Um, we haven't found much of any insecticides. We've only have one positive detection of a, of a neonicotinoid, for example. One point of clothianidin, that, that just came up this last year. 
So we're not really finding the neonics in the spring, which we might expect to see right after planting of the seed coats. Um, but again, not much in the way of, of levels for the atrazine either. Um, and then, uh, like I said before, um, it's not just about chlorpyrifos. Uh, we are finding bifenthrin. So for example, this last September, um, or two Septembers ago, it was mostly a bifenthrin sort of a, a amount. Um, so how do they vary between the edges and the interiors? Well, we're not really finding much difference. There may be a slight effect, but we're, we're detecting uh, points all over the place. Um, oftentimes at not very large levels. Very little has been observed or observed in the soil, so now we're really just focusing our, our thinking about, we have to think about contact um, of these insecticides, not necessarily systemic in injection um, through the plant directly. Um, we're seeing a lot of differences between seasons and um, so to some degree between years. And do those differences correlate with, with population and, and density of um, history of the butterflies, we don't actually have a good feel for that. We've only got two sites that are currently occupied with Dakota skippers and two that don't, um, or that, that don't have them anymore. Um, Pauchik was probably at all of them, but is now gone. So um, that's kind of an open question still. Key question that, that was brought up in the other talks though is what are the biological consequences of those data we're finding, of those drift events? Um, we just don't have good information um, on that. So one of the new pro programs we would like to be able to conduct, and this is through an LCCMR supported research grant that uh, we have, are able to start launching in the next year, hopefully, was to, was to start some of those exposure studies. We know um, now, for example, we're, we're finding chlorpyrifos in a lot of points. We also need to think about then all the other inter interacting pesticides that might be going on. But ideally, we would be able to conduct these controlled experiments where we're exposing them to uh, variable amounts of insecticides in so maybe spray chambers, for example. We expect differences between species. As was brought up a couple times, Paoshik just wants to look exactly like a blade of grass. Dakota skipper wants to hide down in its little hole. Um, so perhaps Pawashik has been, was just because of the nature of the, the na biology of the animal, it's up and exposed more to, to these toxins. Um, same as in the caterpillar and the pupil stage. Um, in terms of surrogate species, we would like to be able to do that because it's obviously not really feasible to be working with, um, you know, pesticide studies on critically endangered animals. Um, so there are a number of skipper species that we've been also rearing at the zoo for the last few years and having pretty good success, especially with the long dash skipper, which is sympatric and synchronic. Um, so logistically, what do we need to think about here? Well, we don't actually have a good idea of when the sampling should be occurring. We're just kind of like sticking your finger in the wind and saying, have you seen any spraying in, you know, in your county in the last weeks? And they were like, maybe. And so we like, say, okay, just drive and start your sampling. So we, we know it's about the, se the season. We, um, we don't exactly know when fields are going to be sprayed or not. Um, so that's been a really difficult part. It's, it's pretty labor intensive, especially at these big preserves, to go out and you know, sample at one point and then go and walk half a mile, collect another point. It's really expensive. Each of those data points are about $400, each of those numbers. So. That's a gigantic hurdle um, to get these really high quality chemical studies. Um, we don't know what the caterpillars are doing in the wild. We can't really find them. So we can't just like flag a plant and say, I'm going to check on you again in three weeks or in, in four months. Um, and the exposure studies then are, are really kind of logistically and technically impossible for some of the protected species. And the faci facilities then for control is conducting really nice controlled studies are pretty rare. So uh, we would like to be able to, to think about that with, with all of you. Um, so thank you. So, yeah. We have time for some, some open questions now for everybody. Um, we are now like 15 minutes into our designated lunch time. We're, we're you know, I'm sorry we got so behind schedule. Um, but I think we could open it up for general discussions over the next few minutes, um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll head off to some lunch.
Yeah, and Nicole. Yeah, hi. Yeah, so um, Nicole in the back there, and, and thank you. Um, our, they have a similar sort of uh, new uh, LCCMR supported study to conduct some of these field samples for, for, for pesticides, um, especially the soybean aphid insecticides. So there's, um, more data is likely to be coming out of the, the field data studies. Yeah, Dan. Are you doing any field surveys? Of in your field surveys, are, are you or is anyone else looking more at skipper uh, community composition or other species? W w would we expect, you know, skippers with similar traits to have similar effects from these pesticides? Can we look at, have you looked at those besides just these two? Yeah, so most of what we have are, are now, um, the, the Dakota skippers and pouchy skipperlings are gone from most of these sites. And so, um, when we are out doing our studies and when Robert Dan is out doing his studies, we're really tracking everything um, and trying to collect data on every single species that we see. And because Pauchik was a super common butterfly, it was, it was an unremarkably common butterfly until it just vanished off of the face of the earth. Um, and so we want to be able to, to hopefully detect other similar sorts of patterns in other species at the same time. Um, most of the skippers, or most of this uh, spraying for the soybean aphids actually occurs after most of the skippers are done for the year. So we're not really finding the adults at, at that point. Um, so it's harder to judge actively what's occurring directly from a single spray event. Yeah. Do you have information on um, trends or population numbers over time? That's one question. And then the other question is, are the life, do you know if the life history characteristics are the same as Powashik yeah. in these other skipper league species. Yeah, so uh, we're, uh, we don't have great data in a lot of places, but we do try to get abundance data whenever possible. Um, a lot of that is more being coordinated through DNR, and we we're doing it opportunistically whenever zoo staff are out there too. Um, in terms of the natural history, uh, we've yeah we've created a big matrix of similar sorts of characteristics, and so far the long dash, the Pallades mystic, is most similar to Dakota skipper. It does the same structure building behavior, feeding on the same hosts. And one of the other questions was um, um, about host plant usage. Um, we have another parallel experiment going on at the zoo right now with uh, no choice experiments with Dakota skippers, for example. Um, but yeah, so there are there are going to be some differences between species. Probably the best surrogate for Pauchik, unfortunately, is probably extinct now in Minnesota too. This, uh, the Garita skipperling, it's the most closely related species. Um, and I've scoured North Dakota for two years now and haven't found it. Um, and uh, it, so it appears to be also contracting in its range. Um, yeah, it's another non-shelter builder, uh, but the Assiniboine Park Zoo in Winnipeg is working on a on trying to understand them too, a, a, a ceremony rearing program. Just wanted to quickly add my. It strikes me that's an extraordinary amount of effort. You talked about each of data points cost, and also that is an effort borne by you at the zoo or borne by LCC, LCCMR dollars. It's just it's a lot of work to figure these, yes. what you should and shouldn't be doing <laughs> out. Nice presentation, Eric. Thanks. Um, so the data you showed from that one prairie strip, not strip, it was a pretty big chunk, where you had those real high concentrations in the middle, is mm -hmm. that kind of an outlier compared to the other sites, or was it just? Um, it's the one where we have the best known spray event data okay. from. And um, in, in one thing, you know, one comment, one comment you made was that the winds were very low, mm -hmm. and sometimes under those conditions we can get a phenomenon called a temperature inversion, where you get warmer air trapped near the ground and then the yeah. cooler air above, and you get kind of a boundary layer there. And in that layer, you can get drift occurring, you know, where kind of those, those droplets or volatiles get trapped there and they just kind of glide along and don't actually make it to the ground. So it'd be interesting to look at those environmental conditions and see if that kind of phenomenon was yeah. happening. That's a good idea. And then again, you know, I guess I just want to say it again, encourage you guys in, the, in these risk assessments, you have data on the parts per million, look at some of the data for larvae of moths and butterflies, pests, you know, there's a ton of them, these products are being marketed yep. to kill these pest lepidoptera, you know, so there's got to be pretty decent data out there, I would think, on, on lethal effects, sublethal effects, all kinds of stuff, you know, parts per million that result in certain 
kinds of effects. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I agree. There, there, should, there needs to be a much better idea of a, a synthesis of that kind of data. Um, right now, we're just kind of scratching the surface on potential average levels we're finding um, in the wild. If I just wondered, in response to that boundary layer point, I wonder if anybody knows that the EPA regs take that into account in addition to. by some people that spray. So like when we spray in our parks, if it, it's a certain humidity level, we know that that happens and we know not to spray when it reaches a certain humidity level. Yeah. It is brought up at pesticide applicator training Sure. Like that. That's great. Yeah. yeah. Right. Just one point about the, uh, you know, what surrogate species and other Lepidoptera, there, there are a couple of butterflies out there in the prairie that have not shown much uh, impact. The regal fritillary, which is a, a prairie obligate, does not look to be declining in any significant way. And then there's a very common grassland butterfly, the, uh, we call it the wood nymph. Um, mm -hmm. That one also is a grass feeder and so some there's some different either differences in in tolerance of these different species or something different in their their larval behavior yeah uh, must be in play yep yeah and i think that's where natural history has a big role and we just don't understand it always yeah okay okay yeah we'll have lunch in the commons room now for anybody who's, who's interested that's just out the door out there, right? Yes, out into the atrium and head off to the left, the left of the atrium. What happens after? What happens after? Sorry. Do you want to speak to the after, after lunch session? Sure. So glad to be back with you. Sorry, I wasn't able to hear all of the presentations, but what I heard uh, was very exciting and very engaging. So um, for those of you who have... Uh, general interest in this topic and uh, have questions. I think the speakers will be around for a little bit longer, uh, but there's a smaller group of you that have actually been invited uh, to a series of events this afternoon. And so those invited speakers and discussants uh, will be getting together to talk about next steps with respect to this topic for, from a research perspective. And in particular, uh, there will be a synthesis of what we know so I'll give you a quick recap of that. But in addition, there'll be a broader question about whether we know enough for our center, which is focused on terrestrial invasive species, to begin to make a significant investment in this to try and find new solutions to deal with the problem. And uh, I think that's going to be a very rich conversation. So um, for those of you who are invited, and George D., I'm not sure where we're meeting for that after lunch. It's... Okay, so after lunch, um, and please have some great conversations during lunch. This is a great opportunity to network, um, and then we'll be meeting in the boardroom. So again, thank you all for being here. This has been a really great day. <laughs>